Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of the Bench Mob ENT Podcast, the best sports podcast in New Jersey. We got a special guest for y'all today, Aaron Robinson, the founder of All Facts Media. Played college basketball at the highest level at Quinnipiac University, Coppin State University. The current video assistant for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Aaron, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, man. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm excited to be here, man. Appreciate you hopping on. So mentioning you played at the highest level of college basketball. Why Quinnipiac? Why Coppin State? Why did you choose those universities to play at? Yeah, I think, honestly, both of them were similar uh, reasons. Uh, well, especially, specifically the first time around Quinnipiac, um, my brother and I have a twin brother named Andrew, um, and he uh, also obviously plays, plays basketball. We, we played with each other our whole lives growing up, AAU, middle school, high school, the whole nine. And we always wanted to play basketball together um, in college. So um, we were both 6'5", wing shooters. So um, we had similar positions coming out of high school. So it was really hard to find a school um, that had two scholarships for two wings in the same year. And so um, we, had, we had a lot of schools that were like, oh, yeah, you know, we'll take one of you guys this year and one of you guys next year. Or, you know, one of you guys can go to this school and the other one can go to, like, this school that's close down the street. You know, we know people over there that will take your brother, da, da, da. And so um, there were only two schools that offered both of us scholarships. Uh, one of them was Niagara, who's also in the MAC. Um, they offered us after our, after our senior year of high school and like, shoot, they offered us, I think it was actually June of 20, 2014, so it was really late. Um, and we had actually already committed to uh, Putnam Science Academy, which is this prep school up in Connecticut. Um, so we had already committed there. So it was basically a decision of either go to Niagara this year or go to uh, Putnam for our postgrad year and then you know, see if we can get some um, together, maybe at a, at a higher level or just kind of a, a better situation. Um, but I honestly really like Niagara, and I was like, man, shoot, like, I, I, I might just mess around and commit here. Um, but I ended up going to prep school at Putnam Science Academy, and it's really, really, really grateful that I did. Um, we were able to meet some amazing people there that I'm still in contact with to this day. My brother and I actually got inducted into the Hall of Fame there um, last summer. Um, and then uh, Quinnipiac actually ended up offering, um, they had already offered my brother that summer going into our postgraduate year. They offered him um, an AAU, but they hadn't offered me yet. But then I got up there, um, I played well, like my first week up there in open gym, and then they ended up offering me. So it was a situation where we really liked, um, the coach staff had been recruiting us for a couple of years. Um, we had a mutual friend named Zaid Hurst, who, had, who was from where, where me and Drew were from, um, back down in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, went to the same high school that we did, Springbrook High School. Um, and he had an amazing career up there at Quinnipiac. He spoke very highly of the university, of the coaches. Um, and then they were, they were going to give us the opportunity to go to school together, which is something that we really wanted to do, something that's really important to us and our family. Um, and then on top of that, they had a really good uh, sports media program, which my brother and I were both interested in. Um, their journalism program is one of the best, um, honestly, in the country. Um, their alums do really well out of school, getting getting good jobs. You're in between two major media markets in Boston and New York. ESPN is right up the road from there, so a lot of people get internships at ESPN and stuff like that. So uh, it was just appealing on the court, off the court. We had a familiarity with the staff. Uh, we went to the campus, and there was absolutely beautiful, gorgeous campus up there. Um, and so we ended up pulling the trigger and going to Quinnipiac. That's fire. That's a dope story, especially being that you and your brother were able to play. I know, like you said, a lot of people may have that idea and that goal. But typically, like you said, if y'all play in the same position, it's not many schools where you're going to get the scholarship for both at the same position. And then y'all ended up having already in the mind the off the court with the sports media aspect. For for you, what triggered the point for you was like, hey, I actually want to get into journalism. I want to represent athletes and tell their stories and tell stories about different teams what point did that happen for you and then what was it that had you and your brother star all facts media yeah man to be honest man it's, it's kind of ironic because i'm because i'm coaching now but when i was an athlete i didn't i never wanted to coach you know i was like man i want to find a way to stay near the game after i'm done playing whenever whenever i put put the ball down i want to stay near the game you know but i don't really want to coach um and so I was like, how can I stay near the game, you know, while also, 
you know, leveraging what I love to do, which, you know, me and my brother, we love talking about sports. That's all we do. Like, we debate sports all day. Like, growing up, we watched, woke up every day, um, watched First Take, watched Sports Center, like, watched um, His and Hers at the time. was on ESPN with Michael Smith and Jamel Hill. Like, we would watch them shows literally, like, every single day. Um, and just talk about sports. We were like, man, like, it'd be dope to have our own show on ESPN one day and do like a twin show or like, something like that, man. And uh, that was our goal, man. We just we, that's what that's what we wanted to do. Like, we just love talking about sports. You asked any of our friends, family, teammates, they, it was say we, we were always talking about debating sports. Um, and so that was really that was really something that we, that we just loved doing. So we were like, man, I want to we want to do journalism. So we both were on like the yearbook committee in, in high school, and he did um, newspaper as well. So it's kind of something that we always had an interest in. Um, and so having this opportunity to go to Quinnipiac where they had a really good journalism program was just icing on the cake. Um, so we were, we were, we were, that was, our, that was our plan. And we went and we majored in journalism at Quinnipiac. We did the whole, um, the whole nine. They have a really good student media program there. They have their organization called Q30 that we both participated in, which is essentially like a student run news organization. So you can get experience writing, you can get experience behind the camera. Um, they have uh, two weekly shows that they do. Um, one is called Sports Pause, which is kind of similar to Sports Center, where you know people you can go um, film highlights, and they they would um, you know show the highlights on on, on Sports Pause, and you would you know have a DB had top ten plays and um, the whole nine yards. And then they had a, a show called Bobcat Breakdown, which was similar to First Take. It was like a debate show, so we would debate different like Quinnipiac sports topics and stuff. So I had the opportunity to do both of those shows. Um, it was amazing. It was amazing, man. So I, I got great hands-on experience there. Um, we had obviously great professors there. I had professors that had won Emmy Award, professors that worked at ESPN, like the whole nine. So we were doing very you know, high-level projects in classes, um, our capstones, like all of that stuff was like very, very high level. Um, and so I was doing that four years, got my degree there, and then transferred to Coppin State for my fifth year. And when I got to Coppin, man, Coppin State is, a, for those who don't know, it's an HBCU, a historically black college and university. Uh, down in Baltimore, um, and a lot of those schools don't have a lot of great funding. Um, so Coppin State didn't even have like a student media program when I went down. They didn't have, they didn't have a newspaper. They didn't have a radio. Um, I had asked, "Hey, do you guys have like a camera?" And I'll even go and film highlights of ga- of games. I'll cut them up and we can have them like air on social media or something. Hell yeah, I mean, we, we wouldn't even have any cameras. You know, my Jack Quinnipiac, they had a whole equipment room with with cameras and lights and microphones and lavaliers and any, anything you could think of. They had. And so, very, very different environment at Coppin State. And so we were kind of like, man, we've, we, you know, been at Quinnipiac four years. We, we, we kind of built up even a little bit of a following, like on social media with uh, some stuff, the, the project that we had done. Um, we had obviously gotten experience on cameras. We were like, man, how can we kind of, you know, keep that, keep the momentum going while we were at Coppin? And so we were like, man, let's just create our own sports platform. You know, let's, let's, let's kind of, you know, cover the cover the athletes here at Coppin State ourselves, and we'll be we'll be student media while we're here. And so we just literally would go to games with our cell phones and we would like record highlights on our phone, put them out on social media. We got a little tripod after the games. We would like go and set the tripod up, do interviews with the coaches, with the players. We would go to like volleyball and, you know, it was, it was super cool. We did, we did like volleyball in the fall, women's basketball a little bit in the winter when, when we weren't playing, obviously, if we, if we could make it to their games, like in the non-conference. Uh, we got to do play-by-play there. They had a, they had, um, they had a local... TV station and the local radio station there that did have play-by-play. So we got to get experience doing play-by-play there for the women's basketball games. Um, and then uh, in the spring, we were doing baseball uh, until, until COVID happened. But especially we were like, man, we just got to figure out a way to kind of keep getting our, keep getting our um, experience, keep kind of sharpening and honing our craft. And so we just literally took the initiative to start it on our own, you know? And so, um, it kind of came out of a lack, honestly, at Coppin State, of a lack of, they, you know, they didn't have a, a, a student media program there. And so we just kind of started. And it was super cool because those, those athletes had never had people come to their games and put highlights out and interview them, and especially students, you know, that were actually at the school that actually cared about their games. You know, we were obviously athletes as well. So um, it was a super cool experience kind of being able to give them the exposure that they deserve. We started a blog. We would do, like, game recaps and feature stories and all, all type of stuff. Uh, while, we, while we were there, man. So it was it was awesome, um, awesome experience. And then obviously, like I said, we were doing baseball in the spring and then uh, COVID hit. So once that happened, like the whole sports world really stopped. The only thing that was really mm-hmm. going on was uh, like people were still in, in college basketball, the transfer portal. That was kind of the, one of the first years where like it was really like booming where, 
you know, guys with grad transfers were, were really, um, really prevalent. Guys were um, still being able to go on like visits and stuff like virtually. Um, they were doing like Zoom visits and whatnot. So people were still committing to schools and whatnot, just as, as they normally would in, in the springtime. And so we obviously had a lot of friends that were still playing college basketball. Um, we had guys that were in the in the portals, with it, and they actually would, you know, give us the scoop to break their commitment. And so then we kind of got into um, the recruiting space a little bit with college basketball. Like I said, we actually had a lot of coach, had a lot of connections with coaches because coaches that had recruited us, coaches that we had coached that we had played against, like in the MAC, where we had a bunch of MAC coaches come on that summer. We had like King Rice, who was at Monmouth. We had Steve Masiello, who was at um, Manhattan. We had. Um, who else came on that year? Um, shoot, we had O'Connor Massarello, who was at Siena. Um, we had a, a assistant named Serge Clement, who at the time was at Marist. We had Baker Dunleavy, who was at Quinnipiac at the time, come on. Um, I'm forgetting some some people. Um, oh, Reggie Witherspoon from Canisius. Um, we had a bunch of coaches that, that came on to our podcast, just coaches that, that had recruited us. We had Pat Scary from Towson, because they had recruited us out of high school. And so then we kind of started getting this niche of like coaches would see our content. So then, other coaches kind of saw, we had like Leonard Hamilton come on, Josh Pastner. Uh, we do Luca Garza because he was from um, the area, so he came on. Um, so we, just, we just, our platform just kind of started growing from there. So we kind of got into this college basketball niche. Um, and so then it kind of it kind of grew, man, and it, it's obviously evolved. That was back in 2019, 2020. Um, and so it's, it's kind of, it's, it's evolved a lot from there. But that was kind of how we started, just kind of out of a necessity um, of, of Cobb State kind of not having student media, and then it kind of just evolved from there. And now, to what, almost almost five years five years later, uh, it's still still going strong. So first, I want to start with Quinnipiac. That sounds like a school that I need to I need to after this need to go check out, take some classes there because that sounds like they have everything there, prepared y'all for everything. And then once yeah. you go to Coppin, y'all basically created y'all own ESPN. Y'all y'all yeah. basically was doing our own ESPN while in college, which is dope. And it was a, a like you said, they didn't have it, so we made it, which I think is yeah. dope. You guys didn't just sit back like, all right, they don't have it. We're not going to do anything. It is what it is. We kind of stuck. You guys went out and created and did it yourselves, which I think is really dope and inspiring for a lot of people that end up watching this. And for me, too, like, you just went and did it. You created the space, and you guys have the experience to be able to do so. You mentioned the journalism aspect for you. Like, what do you think makes a good journalism, a good journalist? And you mentioned you guys were practicing honing your skills. How do you hone your skills and perfect your skills as a journalist? Yeah, man. I think honestly, it's it's just it's just doing. Like we we like you said, we just had to get out and do it. Like it, it's crazy because, like I said, we had great professors at at, at um at Quinnipiac that would you know obviously we had a bunch of teachers that give us assignments that go on and, and their job is to critique our work, you know, but then we got the copy and like I said, there's no media program. So like I would literally send like my, um, like if I was doing like a post game story or a feature story, there were like two professors that I was real cool with. I would literally just send them my work and say, Hey, can you critique this? Can you edit it for me? And like give me some feedback and they would do it, you know, but it was out of me kind of just seeking that feedback, you know? Um, so I think you just really have to do it. You have to be open to criticism. Like when we first, when we first started all facts, like I said, we were just recording stuff on our phone, like, Doing stand ups at different and just just trying stuff. We were doing like we went to like we went to at the time that year the Nationals won the World Series. So we, we like went to DC and was like interviewing fans like at the at the watch party for Game Seven, getting reactions like uh, from the World Series stuff. Like just doing stuff though. Like it was like nobody mm-hmm. like it, we we didn't have a credential. We, we we just went to the stadium for the watch party to watch the game, and we happened to get people's reactions afterwards and just post it on social media. You know, um, we would do like. Any, anytime there was like a big event in sports, we would kind of just record like a little stand up talking about like, hey, like, what's your reaction to this and post it on, on social media, you know? And from there, you kind of see your stuff and you see, okay, how, how can we tweak this? How can we make it better, you know? Like, what can we kind of add to this to make it unique? Um, and then just trying to be ourselves. Like, we couldn't go out there and try to be somebody that we weren't, you know? We had to be unique. We were athletes. We played so we could have a different a different spin on it, a different take on, on things, you know? So I think it's just truly being authentic, being yourself finding your own niche and then seeking out feedback and seeking out criticism um, and just trying to find ways to, to improve your, your product. You know, I think that's, that's really what it is constantly trying to get better, you know, at, at whatever it is that you're doing. So um, that's what I would say, man. I think you have to, you have to have initiative. You have to be creative. You have to be willing to fail. Um, and 
just kind of make make it your own, man. I think those are the biggest things that, that make a good journalist for sure. For you, all of that that you just mentioned, which is great information, what role has faith in God played in you as a basketball player, as a journalist, all facts media, and now being a video assistant, like you said, I said the same thing too when I was done playing. I don't have nothing to do with coaching. And I ended up getting into coaching too, training kids locally around my town. So I definitely could relate to that one. But for you, what has God and faith, what role has that played in your journey? It's been everything for me, man. I mean, the Lord, not only in my, my journey with just like work, but just life in general, man. I think, you know, like this is this is my fourth different state that I've lived in, in the last four years because I was here. I'm here now. I was at Quinnipiac last year, director of player development. Prior to that, I was in LA with the Clippers, um, doing an internship with them. Prior to that, I was in Baltimore doing, you know, my all facts media stuff, working with NBC Sports, doing some writing there. So it's like, you never. There's been a lot of twists and turns um, in the last four years. I had knee surgery. I, I tore my, my patellar tendon in my, in my meniscus, May 2023, May 2023, um, and been rehabbing ever since. So there's been a lot of uncertainty with just my career and my job and. Um, you know, life in general, you know, um, I'm engaged now. I mean, me, me, me and my fiance have had um, just like a, a, a crazy like time for me meeting her to, you know, us dating long distance and me moving across the country, man. And it's just been, I've had to lean a lot on the Lord to just trust that he always had a plan. You know, like there's never, there's never a time where we as, as humans, you know, can, can, can map out what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. The Lord is the author of our story and the perfecter of our faith. And so I think for me, just trusting in his plan and his timing and understanding that even when setbacks happen, like getting laid off at NBC, that he had something greater for me. Or even when I told my patellar tendon and I didn't know at the time, I'm thinking I'm about to stay with the Clippers. I love it here. Like, you know, I'm about to be here for, you know, who knows how long. I tear my, I tear my, tear my knee up, have surgery, have to end up going home and rehabbing and not knowing what's next and the Lord providing an opportunity to go to Quinnipiac and then this whole year at Quinnipiac, you know, having a desire to kind of get back to the NBA and, you know, as a lot of times thinking it wasn't going to happen and then, you know, at the right time the Lord opens the door, you know. And even prior to me going to LA, like worrying about where I was going to live and community and, you know, how my relationship was going to turn out, like he, he made a way, you know. And so I think just trusting him um, through, through all the uncertainty, not allowing life to life's twists and turns to, um, you know, dictate my mood. At the end of the day, like, um, the righteous would never be forsaken, you know, and the promises of, of God are yes and amen. And just having having that in my mind and knowing that at all times, like, you know, all things work out for the good of those who are called, you know, according to his plan. And so I think um, just just knowing that and walking in that and allowing myself to just, to just to be a light in any room that I walk into, no matter what's going on, has, has been, for my life, you know, the only way that, that I've been able to kind of, Stay on my two feet, you know. And nevertheless, in in my in, in these jobs where, you know, a lot of high leverage, high stress environments, you never really know what's going to happen. And so, um, I think with those man, just really trying to always, um, you know, just 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 trust God's timing and trust His plan and trust that it's always going to work out for my good in the end. That's facts right there. Because with the tests and trials and everything that happened, it may not seem that way. You may not know what's going to happen, but you got to remember all the time, like. It's something that I got to remind myself that he obviously has a plan. He's an author and the finisher of our faith. He knew before we were even a thought in our parents' minds, like the plan that he had set up for us. And like you said, it's just trusting him. Like, all right, you might be going to this area right here. It seemed dark, but I'm with you. And that's the that's the biggest thing is like, all right, like you said, I don't know where I'm going to live. I don't know how my relationship going to work out, but he was with you throughout the whole thing. And that's the common denominator denominator and that's what mattered i don't know what's gonna go on i don't know how it's gonna work out but god with me so i believe my father got me so it's just that yeah. that mindset to have like he a good father sure. he's not he's not going he's not going to leave you he's not going to have you be in a position where you in lack like he always takes care of you no matter what for you nice. quinnipiac all that you had there, the professors, even when you was at Coppin State, you had professors that you reached out to. Best advice you receive from a mentor or a role model in that sports journalism space, and even if you want to go into the sports career space in general, being that you got into coaching with the Clippers, the Cavs, you went back to Quinnipiac, what's the best advice you've received so far in your journey? Man, um, 
It's crazy because I, I've I've always sought out like advice from a lot of great people, man. There's been people that you know in my journalism journal, like Dallin Cuff was a was a resource when I was you know trying to figure out my footing um, in, in media, and he gave me some great advice. And obviously in this in this coaching you know um, journey that I've been on, like working with the Clippers, like Lawrence Frank, who's the president of basketball operations, and gave me some great advice. And um, I don't I don't just remember like. The the thing that I can always remember, like even with Dallin, that he told me was like always, you know, we had to take initiative, right? Like we can't, especially in the media, in the media realm, like there's no, there's no like handouts, you know, like it's it's a tough space to break into. Everybody's trying to break into the media. Everybody everybody wants to work for ESPN. Everybody wants to work for for Fox Sports and for all these different platforms. You know, it's like how can you separate yourself? How can you how can you be different? How can you take initiative? Like if something's not there, like. You had to go out and try it and do it, you know. And that was kind of our mindset behind all facts media. Like I'm not, I'm not just gonna sit here and, and use the fact that there's no sports media as an excuse. Like, I gotta go out and find my own way. I gotta go out and do it and create it. You know what I'm saying? And, and I think just taking that initiative, man. Like go out and go out and interview that person. Like go to the national stadium and interview people. Like get out of your comfort zone. Like don't just sit in the house and say, oh well, you know, I don't got, I don't got a credential, so I can't do this. Jeff Goodman was is another but another huge role model. Um, and, and, and been a huge mentor for me in my in my journalism journey. Just like he talked about how when he first got his start, he was just going, he was go to Celtics games, like and just sit outside the stadium and, and, and interview people as, as they came out the stadium. And you, it's hard to do that now, obviously because of you know security and all that stuff. But like, there's just the initiative, right? Like you can always, there's always a story to be told. You have to go out and find them. You know, there, there's every athlete, coach, there's people out here that have amazing stories. You know, you have to go out and find them, but you won't find them if you don't take take that initiative. Um, so I would say with the media media aspect, like that's been the biggest thing that I've just kind of always heard. Um, it's just like go out there, find the stories, like and tell them, you know, and be unique. Don't try to be somebody you're not. Like be yourself and be, be authentic. That's the only way you're actually going to be able to make it. Um, and then from the basketball coaching perspective, like I think you know, I said Lawrence Frank, something he always told me is always find a way to add value. Like how can I make any room that I'm in better? How can I make any team that I'm on better? Like you know. No job too small. If they need me to go and and it's something that Kobe Altman, I, I remember, I never forget. He he came and spoke to our internship class a few, two years ago, and it's crazy now. I'm working for the Cavs, and he's our he's our president of basketball ops. He said, you know, if you ask me to to fold towels, I'm gonna be the best towel folder you ever seen. You know, I'm not gonna complain about having to do these small things because, um, you know, it, it in like if you do the good, if you do the small things well, you'll be able to do the big things well. It, it, it ties back to that the story. Um, Joseph, he was faithful in, in little. He, who, he would be faithful um, with much, you know. But if you're unfaithful with little, you'll be unfaithful with the lie. So if, if the Lord can't trust you to be faithful in this small season, then he can't reward you with the big things in that big season. And so same thing in life, man. Like whatever job you have, you know, you have to do it to the best of your ability, you know. Like Joseph was the best, you know, house attendant in Potiphar's house. And so he got control over the whole house. And then he went to prison and he was the best – you know, prisoner in the prison, so he got he 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 became the overseer of the prison. You know, and then wherever he went, he prospered because he did well with that with that small responsibility. And so the same thing in life, man. Like if I'm the if I'm an intern, like and you asking me to go get everybody a lunch order today, I'm gonna make sure I get everybody a lunch order right. I'm gonna make sure that I have it on time. I'm gonna make sure that everybody has what they need, that they're situated. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not gonna complain that I'm an intern and I'm getting everybody's coffee orders. Like, I'm going to make sure that I'm on time, everybody has their order correct, and I'm doing that to the best of my abilities, you know? And then with that, you get trusted with more and more and more and more over time. And so that's been the, that's been the biggest thing, man. And then, you know, El, like Lawrence, Frank, we always say, like, yo, man, how can I add value? How can I make, how can I make this thing better? Like, what, you know, is there a way that we can do the scouting calendar to make it more efficient for our scouts? Is there a way that, you know, we can make these player development plans more easier to read or easier to kind of process for our coaching staff. Whatever it is, you know, just find a way to add value and do something different that hasn't been done, you know. Um, it could be something, it doesn't gotta be something monumental, it could be something small which makes somebody's day easier, you know. But always having that mindset, how can I add value, um, is something that I would say has been the best, the best advice that I've received for sure. I think that might be the title of the episode right there. Find ways to add value. That's that's facts and like you said on the, the spiritual aspect too is like god says everything that we do even folding towels you're doing it unto the lord so if you had that as the mindset you do everything with a spirit of perfection and the spirit of excellence and you think about luke 16 10 where it says he who is faithful over a little thing 
will be faithful with much. You got to start off with the little thing and not despise the small beginnings because if I could give you one talent and you flip it to three, I can then give you the, the five talents and see what you do with that. You can't then hide it in the ground and be, oh, I didn't get the position I wanted to get. Everybody had to start somewhere. And I think that's really dope, the advice you give. I was going to ask, you know, a piece of advice that you would give to anybody else. But I think if you listening, if you watching this episode right now, that was the advice right there. That, that, we don't need to ask them for give advice. That was advice right there. Just, just pay attention. Right. What, what, what was that uh, Marlon Wayans message? That that was a message right there. That, that part right there. Right there. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you. Gems, gems. Fourth quarter segment. A little fun, a little bit of a fun segment. Kind of a little rapid fire. Different uh, couple questions. We on this podcast, me and my co-host uh, that what we have on, we love food. We love to eat. Uh, a lot like foodies for sure what we always ask i guess your favorite what's your go-to meal that's tough i'm also a foodie man and i love food man but if i had to pick if i had to pick one meal that i feel like will never will never ever let me down bro it's like a little like a seafood alfredo like shrimp alfredo something like that like i, I love seafood i'm from maryland so we know we know we big about our seafood down there in maryland and dmv yes, sir. Uh, and i love pasta like i, I can eat Pasta a million different ways, you know what I'm saying? So it's simple, but like you throw, you throw some shrimp, some scallops, something like that, you know what I'm saying? With some pasta, bro, you will never, ever, ever go wrong with me. I'll be, I'll, I'll eat that any day of the week, you know what I'm saying? So I'd say that's my go to meal if I had to pick one, but man, I, I love food and there's not much that I want. I love Mexican food, I love Chinese food, Japanese food. I, I, I love food, you know what I'm saying? So it, it ain't much that you're gonna go wrong with it in, in my book, honestly. Same here, isn't it? It's not much. That you like my rotation switch and my wife always asks, so what's your favorite thing that you eating now this week? Like and she get along with you a lot. She loves some some shrimp Alfredo. If I make that once a week, she good. She's straight. So <laughs> definitely <laughs> love that. Yeah, speaking right. of it, I gotta get back down to the DMV because we was down there um when I was getting married, somebody in my family had a friend that made custom suits. And she was in Baltimore. She sent us a couple of spots when I got down there to make my soup. Oh, my Lord. Really, really good food. Really good food. All right. So you're Mount Rushmore of sports journalists. Man, this is tough, bro. This is so tough. Like, there's so many different ways that I can go. My Rushmore is four, correct? I'm going to pick four? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, that's, that's tough, bro. That's tough. And and, and, and mine's definitely going to be – I know mine's going to be controversial just because I know people aren't going to – aren't going to agree with a lot of the, well, at least I know one of the people that I'm going to say for sure, people are going to probably agree with it, but um, I'm, I got to start with Stephen A. Smith. And I think people get it twisted right now because of kind of how he manifests himself on ESPN. Like he's, he's a, one of, one of the talking heads. He definitely does more like hot takes now. They use him a lot for like, you know, these like, you know, viral moments, you know what I'm saying? But like, he started as a columnist with the Philadelphia Inquirer, like as a writer, you know what I'm saying, covering the Sixers. And he worked his way up from there as one of the first African-American sports journalists really in, in the space that they even allowed, like, like on television, like huge personality. Like um, growing up, I was like, man, this, this dude, like they let this dude come on here and like be loud and be himself. And like I always admired that because I'm like, I'm, that's how I am. Like, I'm loud. When, I, when I'm passionate about something, like, I, I'm loud. Like, I'm going to, you're going to, you're going to feel me. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, I, I know nowadays, like, they, he's a, he's like, he's more like a hot take guy. But when he first came out and he was like, he was writing columns and he was doing, and the thing is, even now, he does a podcast, he does radio, he does TV. Like, you know, he doesn't write anymore. But, like, to be able to, to be able to write, to be able to do TV, to be able to do podcasts, like, to be able to do all that, you know, um, in, in the course of sometimes in, in a day, like people don't understand how hard that is. You know what I'm saying? And so for him, just being one of the first African Americans to, to navigate that space and to be able to be one of the first black people on television, to kind of people that people that look like us can see him and be like, man, like, um, you know, I, I want to do that someday. You know, it's, I, I think he's for sure he's on my route, Mount Rushmore. So I gotta say him. Um, I'll go Michael Wilbon as well, another African American that. Again, like can write, um, is can is on t been on television forever. Like great, just like neutral, like objective, like um, has been doing it forever. Also, like trailblazed a lot 
um, for African Americans as far as being on television and you know PTI has been on TV for years and years and years and years and years. You know what I'm saying? One of my favorite sure. sports shows to watch. I say those those two for sure are on my Mount Rushmore. I'm going a different direction with the last two. I actually this guy's actually been in the news recently. Um, this this is kind of just a personal favorite of mine. I love Zach Lowe. Um, he he's he actually just got laid off by ESPN, but. Um, he, another guy, man, like can, can do podcasts, can write, like can do TV, like, and he's so smart and he's so well, like prepared on in any of his episodes. I, I love watching the low post. One of my favorite podcasts to watch. If you like the NBA, like you have to watch the low post. Like it's like, you know, it, it's thought out. It's not hot take. It's like factual. It's based on numbers. Like, um, he's, he's very objective. And again, another guy, like, you know, his 10 things columns, like used to be like, Amazing, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. um, but again, another guy that can write, um, that can do long form, that can do TV, that can do podcasts. Like, he's just very versatile, very smart, very educated. And I, I'm always somebody who's loved his content. Um, and then for the fourth spot, man, this, this is where it gets tough. Man, I got to show love to some ladies, man. Like I said, I grew up watching Jamel Hill. She was outstanding on television with her and Michael Smith. Um, Jackie McMullen, another NBA uh, reporter who's done it for a long time. Ramona Shelburne, also um, another woman who's been amazing. Like, I think it's hard to – I'm, I'm going to cheat and put all three of them in, in one spot just because I, I got to show some love to some, to some women. And I don't know which one of them I, I, – it would be hard to pick one. But all three of them, man, like I said, I grew up watching his and hers every day and it turned into Numbers Never Lie. Numbers Never Lie first and then it was, and then it was his and hers. With her and Michael Smith, man, and Jamel, um, she is so intelligent. Again, so fiery. Her personality um, It's just like she and she she's not straight, straight to stay with her chest. And if you follow on social media, she still does to this day. Um, but another super intelligent, like knowledgeable woman, black woman um, who has blazed a trail for a lot of people um, that have come come after her. Um, then Ramona Shelburne and, and Jackie McMullen, um, two women who extremely knowledgeable about the NBA. Also, both can write. Can do TV again. I think that's big for me is being able to be versatile. Like people who can do multiple things can can write, can you know, can do short term, can, can do you know, short form journalism, can do long form, can do podcasts, can do television. A lot of people can't do that. Can do radio. Like that's very important for me. It's just in terms of like, another way you can add value. Like you know, um, be versatile. You know, so that, that's what I would say. Um, that's, 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 that's my Mount Rushmore. I definitely cheated a little bit, but you know, that's my personal Mount Rushmore for me. I mean, anybody that has an issue with that list, I don't, I don't see how you have an issue with that list, man. Like, I get it. Like you said, the Stephen A. one, all right, people might have an issue. But like you said, you got to remember where he came from and the fact that he's doing what he's doing. I always point out to like, yeah, you might not agree with everything he's saying, but the man is a genius because you've drawn in every single time. That's an art to be able to have these takes, how you say it, how you word it, how you set it up to draw you in time and time and time again for same with me like Stephen a and Stuart scott was some of the first people i ever seen on sports and especially like Stuart scott too talking how we talk and i was like yo that i like he keep, he making hip-hop references and he including this and he like swag i'm like oh so we we can't be in this space i'm like I, okay every time you mentioned jack mcmullen jamel hill I like Jamel Hill, too, now, because she stepped away a little bit from sports with her pod. She interviewing everybody from Issa Rae to anybody. Anybody's getting right. on her pod. Politicians. Any, she's very, to your point, too, like, very versatile. Just even, right. just on her podcast alone. I'm like, oh, that's, oh, Michael B. Jordan on this episode? Like, dang, she just got everybody. Big Killer Mike was on one episode. I'm like, yo, Jamel Hill... She go to always in my book. For sure. Always. For sure. We're going to end off. We got a uh, couple questions left, and then we're going to end off again. We thank you for hopping on, taking time out your schedule. If you could draft an NBA all-time starting five, who would it be? Yeah, I get this question a good amount. And I, and I think it's, it's, it's tough, but it's easy for me just because I, I know who I'm going with. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think point guard – I think that I, the only debate is Steph or Magic, and you can't really go wrong with either one of those. I want to get mad at you for picking either one of those. I'm gonna go Steph because I need I need I love the three point shooting, the way he handles the ball. He can play. In, I think he can play in any era with any team. Like he can play 
you know, with any with any group of players, like you got somebody that can handle the ball, shoot the ball, and pass, you'll be you'll be you'll be good to go. But the issue with Magic is if you have too many non-shooters on his team, then it's gonna it's gonna get a little funky. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going with Steph at the point. Um, I'm going with Kobe and Jordan as my two and my three because I I gotta have in my in my opinion those are two of the three best players of all time. You can rank, rank them how you want. Those are two of the two of the two of the three best players. I don't care what nobody say. Argue with your mama. Um, Kobe and Jordan at the two and the three, and then I go LeBron to four. Um, we, we're gonna play a little small, but if I got Kobe, Jordan, and Mike, if I got Kobe, Mike, and LeBron, hey, hey, I'm 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 great. So LeBron is my small small ball. He's six nine, small ball four. Um, and then because I got because I got Steph and I got Kobe Bryant and Mike, like I can I can sacrifice a little a little bit of shooting at the five. Cause I was almost gonna go quick, gonna go KD at the five. We might be a little small, so I'm just, I'm gonna go Shaq. I'm gonna go Shaq at the five because he's the most dominant big man of all time. He's gonna block shots. So if we got Shaq, Bron, Kobe, Mike, and Steph, we ain't losing. I don't care who you got out there. We're not losing to nobody. Like I don't care what your five is. You can put them however you want. We're not gonna lose. So that's my starting five. That five right there might be one of the first teams to go like 79 and three, 80 and two, 81 and one, like. And right. literally, because <laughs> it's those, those three right there, I mean, they all killers. But when you have the obsessive killers of Kobe, Mike, and then you mix Bron in there too, it, I don't even see where they like, all right, we're going to take a game off. Nah, they might mess around and go 82-0. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, bro. <laughs> I'm telling you. Hey, man, Last one. My father, bro. Hey, I I like that far right there. I I can't get <laughs> that far. Steph, like you said, if you ain't got shooters around that, get a little like you said, get a little funky magic. We need to surround you with the right the right group. Steph, a lot of things that people don't actually give them credit for sometimes. If you're not paying attention and you know you enamored by the shooting, he cuts without the ball very right. well, very right. well. So on that team too. Kobe, MJ, they gonna find Steph coming uh, back door. Oh, Steph got a layup, kick it out. Yeah, that's a that's a solid squad right there. Run that through the NBA 2K fantasy right there. That's 82 and 0 right there. Easy, easy. <laughs> okay. Last one before we get you out of here. Your favorite scripture? Man, oh man, this this is so hard, man. I can only pick one scripture. This is just it's tough. Um, man, bro. I don't even think I, I've, uh, I have James one twelve tatted on me. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Having stood the test, you receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I, I love that verse because it's just like, you know, we're all going to face trials. We're all going to suffer in this life. You know, and then another translation, another uh, version says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. Um, for having, having stood the test, you receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And every, everybody's going to endure temptation. Like we're all gonna go through struggle, we're all gonna go through trial. But you know, when you persevere, it, it builds something in you, you know, and you come out better on the other side, you know. And, and there's a reward for your suffering. Um, but I also just love Galatians six nine, man. Like, um, do not do, do not grow weary in, in doing well, for in due season you'll reap a harvest if you don't give up, man. It's like that's life. Like, don't do weary in in doing in doing well, like in in following the Lord and. You know, in your small beginnings, like if like being faithful, there's always a reward for it. Like being obedient to what the Lord is telling you to do, there's always a reward for it. You know what I'm saying? And it's not easy. It's it's hard. Like you know, you know, crucifying your flesh and um, saying no to things that other people say yes to. Like that that's 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 hard. You know, um, but don't grow weary in doing well, man. Because in due season, you're gonna reap a harvest. You know, and it, there's always a reward for it. So. I think I had to pick that one. I was actually, my, I was actually reading that this morning, man. I was like, man, this is this is like it, it, it always hits. It's profound, you know what I'm saying? And so, I think I'll have, one of those two for sure. I think I'll probably go with Galatians six nine. If I had to pick one, but like I, said, I got James one twelve. That was my first tattoo that I got when I was literally in, in college, and that verse has always stood out to me just because, like I said, man, we're all we're all guaranteed to face to face trials in this life, man. Um, but again, like being able to withstand them, being able to come out on the other side, um, there's a reward. There's a reward for it. You know what I'm saying? So, um, that I'll say probably one of those two if I had to pick one. Like you said, 
life lessons. Everything, everything in the Bible can relate to your life in some way, shape, or form. Especially if you read in Jesus's life when he came and he was telling the parables and breaking it down. It was like, all right, I'm gonna have to tell it to you this way for y'all to understand it, and you can apply it. 2024. That was written years ago. Years ago, you can still apply it now. And one of his favorite, one of my favorite parables that he talks about is when they came and the people came back and they weren't ready. And some had the oil and some had their lights ready and some didn't. And was it was too late. The door was closed. You could not, you couldn't get in. That applies to now in life. You always have to stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Bench Mob ENT, we out. Peace.